Welcome to episode 232 of the Skate Podcast. I'm Brian D. Felice, joined by Bridget Pru and Scott McLaughlin. Bridget and Scott, the Bruins, 5-0 on the young season. They sweep the West Coast trip. Some impressive wins along the way. Obviously, San Jose and Anaheim aren't expected to be great teams this year, but the Kings are to be a playoff team. And uh, tonight in Anaheim was a night of first for a couple of players uh, this season. So I guess Bridget and Scott will get into the opening shifts here. Yeah, so... Uh... What you're alluding to the most, I think, is Matt Pasha's first goal and then his second goal, not that far after. Um, and it was also the first time we've seen that line together of DeBrusque, Patra, Geeky. And once again, it was we've the Bruins have been on this road trip. This is the third game of the road trip. They've had a different top six line combination every single time. And I think since the beginning of the season, not just on the road trip, but um, we were wondering what a line that DeBrusque and Patra together would look like, and we kind of got our answer. And it seemed like Matt Patra can drive that line, and we, we know Jake DeBrusque is another player that can drive offense on a line, but tonight it was Matt Patra. Um, he got his first NHL goal in the third period, I I think only a minute or, or so after Anaheim scored. So the Bruins were able to tie it right back up, and then – he also scored the next goal, uh, and he was obviously very excited. It's his first goal. Looked good, I would say, throughout the game. And on those two finishes, he's right around the net. Uh, he's waiting for the puck to bounce out to him, and he's able to finish it. So uh, he had a great game. I don't think he'll ever forget that one, and that's my opening shift. Yeah, I mean, technically, the Bruins have four more games to decide whether they're going to keep him and start his entry-level contract or send him back to juniors. And unofficially, I think he already made that decision for them, uh, which obviously we're, go we're going to get into more. But my opening shift uh, is the other big story of the weekend, which is that Jake DeBrusque was a healthy scratch on Saturday after being late for a team meeting. Gets back in the lineup Sunday and plays a key role on both of Potter's goals and that that line of DeBrusque, Potter, Geeky, as you mentioned, was really their best line all night and ends up getting rewarded with the goals. But uh, DeBrusque started the transition on the first one with some good work along the boards in the, in the D zone. And then the second one, he has the shot that leads to the rebound that Potter buries. So a good response from DeBrusque on the ice and obviously off the ice, you – hope he you know makes it a point for this to be a one-time thing that does not crop up again this season uh, Montgomery said he handled it professionally didn't really go into any more details than that but you know obviously something you don't want to see from DeBrusque you know we know he's been healthy scratch before as far as we know never for something like this like being late for a meeting um, but you know he's not a kid anymore he's 27 years old it shouldn't happen, but I think he'll be okay as long as it doesn't happen again or something like this doesn't happen again. Yeah, and we're definitely going to circle back to that storyline. And for me, I would I would say that early on this year, the the Bruins having a new crop of players and yeah, a funky schedule to begin. I just thought that they showed themselves very well. Obviously you know, winning in San Jose, winning in Anaheim, but that, that Kings game to me, um, I thought was a really good test for them. They passed their first true test of the season. Uh, the Kings are a big team, strong team. They're deep down the middle, um, you know, playoff expectations for them. And I just thought that the Bruins, something clicked emotionally and physically in that second period. And, you know, Trent Frederick kind of led the charge there with a, a really, really strong fight, uh, excellent fight against, uh, against England for the Kings. And I thought it was just, again, you mentioned DeBrusque being 27. Trent Frederick, I think, is like 25 or 20. You know, he's mid-20s you know, already. And um, the, these guys, like, they, they're, they're getting into the primes of their careers coming up here, and, and they're not rookies anymore. And you're starting to see that maturation maturation process for Trent Frederick in particular. So, um, yeah, I thought it was a great showing from him in the Kings game and, uh, and for the Bruins in general. That, that was a very, very important win gutsy win shows that this this group of guys is capable of playing that style of play yeah it, it you know so i guess like we should you know probably circle back to patra like that's that's the big story coming off 
Sunday night's game. And I think to me, like almost what's even more encouraging than the goals themselves was that this was the second night of a back-to-back and the Bruins were really playing very sleepy hockey for two periods there. Now both teams were like the Bruins weren't, you know, that they weren't really getting dominated for a couple stretches. They were, but it was just a very uneventful game for 40 minutes. There just weren't a lot of scoring chances either way. It was zero, zero after two periods, but Patra was like the one, maybe the one Bruins, certainly one of only a couple who was actually creating some chances in the first period. He had, uh, he, he like spun off a, a check in the neutral zone, had a good zone entry, ducks a hit along the boards, and then sets up Matt Grizzly charging to the net. Great A chance, doesn't get rewarded with with a goal or you know in his case an assist. Second period during a four and four, he steals the puck behind the Anaheim net, sets up Kevin Shattenkirk for a point blank chance. Again, another save. Game stays scoreless, but. He on a night where like very few Bruins are making anything happen, he was. He was the spark. And then finally he gets rewarded with with the two goals after the Bruins go down one nothing. And I, I feel like that's what it was. Like it was like rewards. Like on, on those two goals, he wasn't really the one doing the bulk of the work. He ends up as the finisher. Um, you know, his line mates are are the ones setting him up, but it's like you know, sometimes sometimes hockey karma is a real thing. Matt Potter is the best player on the ice, and he ends up getting to be the hero with his first two NHL goals. Yeah, and you say he gets rewarded, but a lot of people have been rewarded by the plays Matt Potter has made throughout the season, or at least should have finished on some of the passes that he sent out. Like you mentioned the Shattenkirk play. I thought he could have finished that, and that could have been a goal, and that would have been another point for Potter already. And throughout the game, you know, obviously those two goals come in the third period, and I'm just sitting there like, somebody put this in for him because he had so many good setups and I'm like, somebody put one of these in for him because he's the only guy on this team who has a nine game slate that he has to, you know, it would help him tremendously if points, goals, assists are as high as they can be. So he's setting other people up and I'm like, somebody just has to help this guy out. Like just finish all these great plays that he's setting up. And then what does he do? He does it himself and he scores two goals Uh, against Anaheim and so once again he makes it impossible for people to be like he didn't do enough no he scored twice um he had the game tying goal and the go-ahead goal uh so what more do you want him to do in that situation he was creating offense he was setting up scoring opportunities and then he was finishing so uh, the only other thing that you could say you wanted out of him was maybe a little bit more defense but we're we're talking about um someone who is doing pretty much everything right tonight on the ice. So uh, he has completely made his case again. We didn't really question whether or not he was going to all of a sudden fall off a cliff and not stay on this team past the nine games. I think we were all pretty much in agreement from the beginning that he, we weren't just going to see some like reversion of what he was doing. So um, it was a great night for him. And he, we have one more game on this road trip. We, we had all said, oh, I think he's going to have his first goal on this road trip. Well, now he has two. So uh, we'll see what else he can do before the Bruins come back home. But Yeah, I mean, if he wants to be a Boston Bruin, he's going to have to drop the gloves more. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, obviously. Um, no, Frederick has that covered. Frederick is insane. Uh, he dropped the gloves, and then he was just smiling and laughing like a crazy person in the box with his nose bleeding. And I was like, oh, you know, some, something's a little... Something's a little off. <laughs> Something's off about the, the, the kind of players that just go out there and they get punched in the face and they're bleeding out of their face and they're just laughing. Yeah, he's, he's you know, one flew away from the cuckoo's nest for sure. Um, but I think, um, Bridget, we talked about it last episode, I believe. Um, in regards to Patra, he just, even before this, this West Coast trip, the first two games of the year, he just – he just found a way to impact games. Uh, he he initiated goals and, and and scoring plays, scoring rushes. And you guys have you've covered tonight's game against Anaheim, so I'm gonna go a game back and 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 the Los Angeles Kings game. It's one to one, and the Bruins you know take the lead in the second period there on a on a dynamic shift uh, from Patra in the offensive zone. Just um, you know. 
great passes, you know, to, to Forber and, you know, getting shots on net, um, uh, corralling those loose pucks, getting it back to Forbert. And, and it, it kind of stinks because he should have gotten an assist on the, on, on that, on that Morgan geeky goal. But, um, because he passed it to Forbert, Forbert one times it, and it goes to Geeky, but it did hit Lucic in the ankle, so Lucic gets that second assist. So you're kind of like in a nine-game trial, if if the Bruins are for some reason blind to that and are just looking at points or something like that, which you know they're not. Uh, and Montgomery talked about it afterwards how that that was all Patra, but you just like to see you know him get a point there just to help his case a little bit. But obviously, anybody with a pair of eyes saw that he was integral in that play. So yeah, I mean well, he's just keeping himself. Uh, around for the long haul for sure and that play took lucci out because he <laughs> he didn't play tonight he ended up getting the puck right into his skate and he went to hop out on the ice for warm-ups it looked like already as he was walking out something was completely off so as soon as he put weight on that foot he went one loop around came off and and brown played again so that it's funny you mentioned that play because it wasn't about that at all but lucci we're not 100% sure what that injury is or how long he'll be out, but it seems like if that was why he didn't play in the second game of the back-to-back, -back, then that shot that hit him in the foot really is uh, is nagging him. Yeah, certainly a, a well-earned assist on his part. Um, and I think it's safe to say that that is what held him out Sunday because uh, you could even see him like on the bench Saturday night after that. He, he was kind of like flexing it quite a bit, like, shaking it around he ended he didn't play the final six minutes of the game so i think even by by that that point it was bothering him quite a bit and yeah it was it's it's not funny because like obviously his, his foot hurts but like seeing him try to go out for warm-ups it's like i i think if he was being honest with himself he probably knew when he got to the rink that he wasn't going to be able to play but you try to you jam jam your swollen foot into the skate and try to convince yourself you can still play and uh yeah it wasn't wasn't gonna happen for him no no reason and no real reason to push it by the way um it, it is interesting like speaking of Lucic though to draw a parallel with with Patra it was on a west coast trip 16 years ago that a 19 year old Milan Lucic basically earned his spot in Boston to stay. And he, he talked about that out on this trip um, leading into the LA game, because that was, it was in LA where he scored his first NHL goal and actually had a Gordy Howe hat trick in that game. And he said he felt like it in the moment and looking back on still feels like that was like officially the game where he stuck and, and made it clear that he wasn't going anywhere. And I think Potter just had that game Sunday in Anaheim. And that's, this is the game that we're going to look back on and be like, yeah, that's when he officially stuck. Um, can I do one, one quick trip to a advanced stats corner here? Because this is, we already know you're going to make as many trips as you want. So just, just go ahead. You started out early. Go ahead. So this is my favorite stat off Padra's performance on Sunday with him on the ice at five on five high danger chances were five to one Bruins with anyone else on the ice and Potter on the bench, high danger chances were 10 to one Anaheim. Like that's, that's a different, that's a difference maker right there. Yeah. I mean, I, I can see his number in the rafters already 15 years <laughs> from now. So if he keeps 51 or if he decides, maybe I want something else. I well, Krejci kept 46. Bergeron kept 37. Those sound like training Lucci, camp numbers. Lucci 462. Yeah, you, well, you can't. And then now, obviously, he's not 62 anymore. But I was watching the yeah. footage from that exact road trip Scott was talking about. Yeah. And they're like, oh, wait, he, he's wearing 62 back then? There, there are some training camp numbers the player can make. No one can make 62. Wayne Gretzky couldn't even make 62 a cool number. So, uh, you know, Lucci's had to get rid of that one for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, look, the kid, he, I mean, Potra has been awesome. It, it, there, there's no doubt he's sticking around. He's deserved it. He's been a difference maker all, all along. And by the way, it's like, you know, he's, he's obviously it's his first, you know, couple of weeks in the, in the show. And, you know, I'm watching him against Kopitar, uh, you know, winning faceoffs against Anze Kopitar, um, in, in LA and just, yeah, he's just, he's, 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 he's here to stay and there's going to be some learning curves and he has to, you know, 
you know, grow into his body and whatnot. But I mean, he's making his team better and uh, it, it's, it's a no brainer. So um, if, if you guys don't mind, I would like to circle back to, to Scott's um, DeBrusque take. And I guess obviously he, he responded well on the ice in Anaheim had a, had a breakaway and a penalty kill within the first two minutes shot out of a cannon. And as you guys mentioned, was involved in the Potra goals and whatnot. So, you know, he bounced back on the ice. Um, I guess what I was surprised about was that the Bruins made it so public. Were you surprised that not only Montgomery talking about why he was scratched, uh, but also the Bruins uh, social media literally just tweeting out and, and like saying, yeah, DeBrusque is scratched because he missed the team meeting. Um, not a lack of transparency in the 100th season. No, and and I think – so I think it's twofold. I think part of it is, one, you're, you're making an example of it early in the season. That's going to set the tone for everyone else that this won't be tolerated and you will be called out for it. And two, I also think it in a situation like that, I actually think it is good to clarify, like, to just straight up say he was late to a team meeting, because if you don't say that and you just say he's a healthy scratch, now everyone can speculate about whatever they want and people can question his effort and they can wonder if he's, you know, what, like you, you can pick anything. Did, did he go out late at night on the road? Like you can make up all sorts of things and speculate about whatever, if they're not going to be specific. So in the grand scheme of things, you know, being late to team meeting, again, not good, not acceptable, but it's not, it's not the end of the world. Like it's not the absolute worst thing someone can do. Um, when they're on the road, usually their team meetings are at the hotel. Like usually they just get a conference room or something. My, I don't know this, but my guess is like he either didn't set an alarm or slept through an alarm or, or something like that. Right. Like they're all in the same spot. So it's not like he had to, get somewhere and like hit traffic. So um, again, like it can't happen, especially with the players been around as long as DeBrus. But I do think it, when you make it clear what it is he did, it, it also helps kill speculation about other stuff that would probably be seen as even worse. Yeah. And like, I've, if it was just sleeping through an alarm, that's nothing, right? We we don't know the details of it, but I've I've slept through alarms. I've I've most of the time it's uh my alarm doesn't go off for whatever reason because I have a phone that just doesn't like to cooperate with me. But um yeah, I think it it is helpful that they put that out there. Otherwise, you know, people are probably when they saw him scratch from the lineup, they're like, Oh, okay, I gotta check Twitter, and then you go right to Twitter, it's right there, um, late for a team meeting. Um it's the first time we've seen him discipline though under Montgomery, if I'm correct. Like we, all of the other discipline we've seen was with Cassidy. Um, and I don't think this is like a sign that there's like a worsening relationship between the two of them, but just to, to, to point it out that ever since Jim Montgomery took over, Jake DeBrus hasn't really had some of the issues that, um, or we, we haven't seen a clash, I guess you could say, a, a butting of heads between him and the coaches. So um, once again, like I can empathize with someone if they slept in a little bit late. Uh, <laughs> I've had times where my alarm did not go off. And luckily my body clock was like, I woke up 10 minutes later naturally because it was like, ah, you should probably be up. But um, well, to be fair, though, when you're going from the East Coast to the West Coast, it's a it's a tough sell to that you slept in. <laughs> I mean, you're gaining three true. hours. <laughs> so, true. Um, yeah, I mean, you should be up very early in the West Coast if you're from Boston. But um, that's just all our curiosity. It's not yeah. I mean, if he was probably he was probably a, you know in a long line at Splash Mountain or something. Just you know, <laughs> it is what it is. It happens, you know. But um, yeah, I mean, hopefully, you know. You know, it, you kind of nip the story in the bud and just move on. I mean, um, I guess I was just surprised that, like, you know, they wanted to make it be so public because of, you know, you know, I'm not certainly one to, you know, coddle players. I just, you know, if it if it doesn't need to be, you know, publicly embarrassing the kid who clearly is mentally kind of, at least in the past, a little mentally fragile when it comes to public scrutiny. So, um, but you know what? 
if that's a, if the, don't miss a team meeting then be a professional right so um that's on him so anyway and i'm sure that's what the message was right so um but yeah he, he came back he played well that line looked really good uh, obviously especially later on um you know my my opening take obviously i guess uh encouraging for you guys to see that that the Bruins can 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 play a you know a big boy style of hockey with this this collection of players I mean obviously a, a testament to a team's ability is um having different ways to win uh different games when need be and, and I guess it's you know early on but but they pass that first test yeah and Jim Montgomery said after the game in Los Angeles that he felt like they were starting to establish an identity and We've we've certainly heard a Montgomery who has been in the early going more critical of his team than I think he was uh, probably at any point last year. Not that last year's team gave him any reasons to be critical, um, but I feel like even early on last season, it was there was a lot of like praise for you know for the Bruins' effort and uh, for like how professional they were, and he was you know clearly like he was kind of just blown away by maybe how this team acted and played and went about their business compared to other teams he had been around. And now I think he's, you've seen a coach who said like in his, when he was up on the dais with um, Neely Sweeney, Charlie Jacobs after last season, he was talking specifically about the playoffs, but he said like, he felt like he needed to be a little more hands-on needed to do more to motivate guys. And I think that's kind of part of what you're seeing from him early on is he's not going to be so quick to, to hand out praise and he's going to, he's going to make guys earn it. But there was some there after the Kings game because he felt like his team had had earned it and had been building the way that he wanted them to. Um, And, you know, part of that identity is like, all right, that they're getting the goaltending. By the way, so through five games, they have the best goaltending in the NHL in terms of save percentage. No, you know, no real surprise given that they returned that tandem from last year, but that is a key to the team and is part of their identity. Um, they've mostly been a really good five and five team. Not Sunday, obviously. I don't think a whole lot was good Sunday, but they've also been, they continue to be really good on the penalty kill. They've, only allowed one power play goal against, and that was late in Saturday's game when really the game was already out of hand. It was already over. Um, you know, power play had had started to do better. They didn't score on the power play Sunday, but I did think they had some chances. I thought I think it might have been their, I don't know, third power play of the game, especially like they had some really good chances and looks. So it seems like they're kind of starting to find a groove there as well. And it's, you know, like that all factors into how they want to play. And, um, you know, Montgomery's also praised their physicality recently. So you you are starting to see like more consistently what he, what he wants from them. Yeah. Yeah. I I think so. And uh, we did get a question that kind of like brings together Scott and I's, for shifts, which was, um, Scott, you sent me this email earlier. It is from Brian in East Bay. And by the way, Brian, if you want to say stuff on this podcast, you don't have to like go under an alias or anything like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the, the, Thank you. <laughs> the question was, with DeBrusque a scratch, this is after the Saturday game, with DeBrusque a scratch and Frederick in the dressing room getting his knuckles cleaned up at the end of the Saturday game, uh, second period, Monty rolled out the Marshawn Zaka Pasternak line, which immediately resulted in a goal in the third period. If he sticks with the top line of that line, and then also the JVR coil Frederick as a third line and the fourth line of Lucci Beecher Lauco, that kind of does just leave you with the DeBrusque Potter geeky as your, you call it, call it your second line. Um, and he referred to it as the misfits, uh, that have to find chemistry uh there's a lot of stuff going on with that so thank you brian for the submission um you're welcome i'll start off by saying that i'd wanted to see debrusque and yes not yes you brian uh (laughs) totally 
not the same guy that sent the email. Uh, so I'd wanted to see how DeBrusque and Potra's chemistry were together anyway. Um, that's a line that I think kind of made sense. And we talked about it right out at camp, put DeBrusque on his wing and see what he can do. Um, so him and Patra, it seemed like, you know, you have a playmaker and you have a finisher. I don't see why that couldn't work as a combination. So we, we see that line effective on Sunday and because it was such a weird game, maybe didn't get to see how that line would click regularly five on five all that much, but, um, yeah, geeky has carried his weight as well. He has. And, and that combination kind of allows Van Riemsdyk and Coyle to be in a natural, uh, third line, so to speak situation. And, and obviously that leaves, look, if, if Marshan, what do we call on Marshan Zaka and, and Pasternak, like the imperfection line or something like that? What's, <laughs> what's, what's, what's their nickname? Like- so like I was thinking of the same thing during the game. I'm like, it's the perfection line. If only like you just pretend that Sokka is Bergeron or like you just like the like the Zerfection line or something. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, they were great. Against... Keep workshop in that one. Yeah. yeah. Got it. <laughs> I mean, look, they 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 were great. They were great against the Kings. Um, obviously a little bit more quiet in Anaheim, but I mean, I think. Obviously, Marshan and Pasternak have that chemistry. They, I mean, they haven't really played on the same line consistently for the last couple of seasons, but, you know, it doesn't take them much. And then, you know, can Zaka in his prime be, you know, X percentage of Bergeron in his mid-30s, like, to, to make that line kind of dynamic like it was a couple of years ago? Obviously, it's a big difference with El Bergeron, but you know what I'm saying. Um And then, yeah, I mean, the the Potra, DeBrusque, and Geeky line. And then, again, you have Coyle, Van Riemsdyk, and more suited roles on a, on a cup contending team, which would be a third line with, with Frederick who continues to improve. So um, obviously the fourth line is without Lucic right now, but I just think, yeah, I, I think, I think DeBrusque and Patra, I think there's a lot of potential there, both, you know, 27 years old for DeBrusque is, you know, clearly is still young and Patra is just, you know, I don't even think he's shaving yet. So there's, there's, there's time for them to get uh, chemistry together for, for years to come. Honestly, if, if Potch is going to be a top, top two center for this team and why not see if they can click uh, right now? I think like we, we wanted to brusque with Potch and Marshand obviously, but hadn't had a chance to see that. So just by chance, you know what? Great job by DeBrus to sleep through the team meeting and Lucci's to get hit in the ankle with the shot, because for those two reasons, these are the kind of the, the way the lines have shaken out now. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting, like the three games on this road trip, each game we've seen a, a line that was just put together dominate. Thursday in San Jose, that was the first game for the Van Riemsdyk, Coyle, Frederick line. They were the dominant line in that game. Saturday in LA, basically like mid game is when Marshan, Zaka, and Pastor get put together. They take over and dominate that game combined for two five on five goals and then another power play goal um, with Marshan setting up Pasternak. Then Sunday, we get the first look at the DeBrusque Patra geeky line and they take over and dominate. So it's, you know, now like now you keep those combinations together. I'm going to assume this is going to be the lineup Tuesday in Chicago, barring something unforeseen. Um, And, you know, Realistically, like you probably don't need all three dominating like every single night, but that Martian Zaka Pasanak line is obviously your clear top line. So that's the one that that's the one you're going to expect to be there consistently. Doesn't necessarily have to score every night, but give you good shifts the overwhelming majority of the time that they're on the ice. And then those other two lines, which I don't know if I really view either one of those as like the clear number two line. I I think just call them both like middle six lines Um, because on any given night, I think one of those could be better than the other. Like, you know, there's going to be nights where JVR coil and Frederick get a lot of ice time and we see them dominating in the, in the ozone like they did on Thursday. And then there'll be games where DeBrusque Patrick geeky can create some chances and score like they did on Sunday. So, you know, neither one, like you look at those on paper and neither one of them is like, a great second line on paper. 
but you you kind of put them together as your middle six and it's like you can see that being a really effective middle six so um i don't really think it matters like how you put those on the depth chart as long as that top line of marsh and zaka pasternak is carrying their weight which i'm not sure they really did on sunday but second night of a back-to-back you get the win anyways let's see how they come back on tuesday but that should be a, a really good top line well i mean if if you found out an effective line each of the first three of four games on the road and you're going to stick with the next game in chicago um like you if you've solved that at this point then you're you're in a good position and i think it should be pretty obvious that a Marshawn Zaka Pasternak line could be effective. Like that sounds like a line that would work because just insert Zaka instead of Bergeron and they can be kind of similar players. Um, and when you put DeBrusque with Patra, uh, I see the benefit of that. And then I guess really the one we were wondering more so before we saw it would have been how Van Riemsdyk looked against Coyle and Frederick. So the fact that that line has been as successful as it's been and, you know, tough and even with a lot of speed on that line um, that they've been able to create chances. I think you're, you're in a better position than when you left Boston, knowing that those are options for you, because I think one of the main reasons why we didn't think they should put Marshawn on that top line was because we wanted them to spread out their best players. Um, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case for the most successful lines. Yeah. And, and, and the, obviously I feel like we all kind of agree that Bruins are a true top six winger shy of like, especially if Patra can be, I mean, Patra's got three points in his first five NHL games and he's been playing well without scoring points as well. So like, you know, you kind of see some good potential there obviously, but, um, so he, you know, he still has to prove him, continue to prove himself. But let's say he does, you know, the Bruins seem to be a top six winger shy of where they probably want to be come playoffs. But besides that, like they have, they have depth and balance. And, and as Scott mentioned, like, yeah, like the second, the Potra line and the coil line, neither one of them is like a dynamic second line. Um, But when you, when you're talking regular season success, they certainly have, you know, balance and, and scoring, uh, scoring ability at least um, throughout this lineup right now. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think they're in good shape. Um, I talk to me again in, you know, March when we see what this team needs for, you know, a, a hopefully a deep playoff run. But for what this team needs to do until then to get to the playoffs, like they have enough. Th- this team has enough to get to the playoffs currently as it is, and I think pretty comfortably um, especially when you look at the Atlantic division and it's kind of ass backwards right now obviously the Bruins are playing well um, which is consistent year to year for the most part but I mean Tampa's off to a slow start Toronto I mean you have Ottawa and Detroit are playing well Buffalo I mean Bridget and I were high on Buffalo going into the year like maybe this year that they crack a, a bubble bubble spot or um, wild card spot or third third seed and they've just com- have come out of the gates stumbling and so i don't think the bruins have an issue making the playoffs obviously but as far as the springtime they could use a little more high-end scoring probably but for now until then i mean depth and balance they kind of have it yeah i mean really like the whole eastern conference is kind of a mess to start like you mentioned the red wings like they have the best goal differential in the east uh the Flyers are on top of the Metropolitan Division. Um, you know, Carolina, my – I told I told you guys, like, I my Stanley Cup picks, I just curse. So the Hurricanes are off to a poor – well, the three and three, but they are giving up a ton of goals. They've given up 30 goals in six games. Like, that – defense was supposed to be their strength, and they are – they're a sieve. Like, teams are just running through them, scoring – scoring at will. So a lot of work to do there. Like New Jersey's been up and down. So um, I had to explain to some college kids what the word civ meant the other day at BC. Okay. Well, that's, that's embarrassing because college kids (laughs) should know more than anyone. Like it's it's the the best chant. It's the best chant in college hockey. 
I was sitting next to some kids at BC and the 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 crowd in behind the goal is going sib 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 and they're like, what is he saying? I don't know. I don't. What is? I'm like, guys, guys, let me just explain it to you. A yeah. sib means, and it was just some yeah. you you know. I mean, actually, maybe like we we're not used to sitting in the crowd anymore. So like, I'm used to sitting next to Scott, and the only gallery he hears is me saying annoying stuff. So like, he's not used to. And I'm not used to going and sitting in the crowd and hearing like people say just crazy things and not understand anything about hockey. So I was sat next to some people who had never been to a hockey game. And I was just explaining that. I had to explain what a Civ was. So. They're they're calling for a friend of the podcast, Sarah Sivian. That's what they're doing. Yeah, they were. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Civ, Civ, Civ. Um, but yeah, if it's, I mean, since we just kind of touched on the standings, also worth noting here, like on – along the lines of the Bruins just banking points and and putting themselves in a good position. This is only the second time in Bruins history they've started five and oh, like it's, it's pretty crazy. And the the last time was 1937, 38 when they won their first six games. So if they win Tuesday night in Chicago, they tied their best start ever. Um, I know we all learned the last season that, you know, regular season records don't mean a lot. And I, I already see on Twitter, like I, tweeted that out at the end of Sunday's game and you already get replies of like, Oh, they're going to like some more records in the regular season and losing the playoffs. And it's like, listen, I don't like, don't watch until the playoffs. If that's your ad to like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I'm sorry. They can't win a round in the playoffs in October. Like all, all they can do is get off to a good start and put themselves in position to make the playoffs. And they're so far trying- they're doing that. They're, those people are trying to just temper their expectations or like, I don't want to be hurt again. I can't, I, I'm not ready to be hurt again, but it easily could be their best start, Scott, because they play Chicago uh, next game and then they play Anaheim again at Boston and then they play Detroit. And then I guess I would say their first real test comes uh, just after that when they play Florida and then Toronto. Well, I mean, Detroit right now looks like a pretty real test. Yeah, like it's that, true. But still, you have two games before that that you you could win before yeah. you have to go through Detroit, which is Chicago and Anaheim again. Can, can I ask a, a question, which maybe would be better off for an opening shift one of these days, but I'm going to spoil it right now like a three-week carton of milk. Um, are the Bruins, did they just avoid like a potential like – ever having to like rebuild in the, in the next like 10, 15 years. I mean, honestly, like they just lost Bergeron and Krejci and like, we knew, we knew that they had good defense and goaltending. And like, we kind of, none of us thought that they'd ever be, um, you know, a bottom 10 team post Bergeron and Krejci immediately, just because you have that, that structure and that foundation. But like, if there was ever a year where they were going to take a massive step back, like, why would they, why would it be next year now? Like you just, did they, did they, did they just, do we just dodge a massive bullet? Like we all thought they would still be somewhat competitive, but like, I mean, do we see them like even like missing playoffs? If they they have this core in place going forward, like anything can happen. Anybody can have an off year, but I think they kind of may have dodged a bullet here. It seems like. Right. To to your point about the five and zero star. And like, yeah, we don't think it's a fluke. Right. Like I, I, Obviously, you still want to see them get through a tougher stretch in their schedule, which will come at some point. You know, they've really only they've played one team so far that we think is going to be a playoff team. Um, I guess I mean maybe Nashville. I guess could could be a fringe playoff team, but um, yeah, like I, we all picked them to make the playoffs, and we all thought it would be somewhat comfortably, at least in the sense of like. We didn't have them as wildcard teams. I know a lot of people did. But, yeah, like, again, when you have the defense and goaltending that they do, you should win a lot of games. <laughs> like, it's, uh, you know, I know there's going to be that discussion down the line again of what do they do with Allmark and Swayman down the stretch or in the playoffs? How do they handle that? Do they split them? Do they have to pick one? If they pick one, can that guy be counted on to start seven straight games? Like that conversation is all coming again. But in the meantime, you have the best tandem in the NHL. You're rotating them night in, night out. They're both off to fantastic starts. As I said earlier, you, for the second year in a row, have the best team save percentage in the league. So, um, like, yeah, that's going to, it's going to get you pretty, pretty far. 
But like, do you see that going like away? This- do you guys see that going away? Like the the goal t- the, um specifically with the goal t- like you have Swayman. So if Allmark goes, he goes, but you have Bussy down in Providence, but like you have McAvoy and Lorai down on the pipeline and you have Carlo and Lindholm. Like, do you see those going that going away anytime soon? Well, yeah, I was going to say to specifically answer your question about, did they dodge a rebuild? I think so. Like, I, I think that they like genuinely, it's hard for me to imagine what would need to go wrong. Like the way that the contracts they have in place are set up. It's not like they're set up to lose as many guys as they did last year. They brought in two new centers who have been viable in their roles that are young and that will be here for a long time. If you want to extend them, but they still have time on their contracts. So obviously we're going to find out soon um, if they opt into Patra's first year of his entry level contract. Um, But still like you're set up with term and younger players that you don't have to worry about them aging out of being you know, as successful as they have, like we're, we're talking about a younger team that usually you would see have a bigger learning curve than what they're dealing with right now. So you have a good mix of guys that you have locked up long-term guys that have come in and, and played very well in the roles that they were um, picking up from veteran players. And it's hard for me to see how what the Bruins have currently could go so wrong that they do need to just strip everything down, trade away assets, go back and get things in the draft because they kind of do have what they already are looking for right now. It seems like. And you get the cap going up too, right? Presumably. So, I mean, like next year they can go and buy what, what they feel like they need. I mean, yeah. I mean, like you get, you have McAvoy, you have Swayman, you have Pashnak and yeah, I just, if, if there was going to be a year in the next whatever, like I'm not, I'm not suggesting that they can't potentially miss playoffs at any point in the next, I'm just saying like everybody has that risk, I suppose. But like, if there was ever going to be a year where they were going to take a major step back, it'd be this year. Okay. So fine. Yeah. They're five games in and they haven't played the best competition, but I mean, look around the league, everybody's kind of had jumbled competition and the best teams have faltered so far. So, you know, yeah, yeah and, if you and think about I never they've extended like they've extended Lindholm and the, the one person that kind of just clearly stands out is like, well, they extend DeBrusque, but they've extended Pasternak. He has a brand new contract. Uh, Lindholm, McAvoy a few years ago. If you look at the guys that they wanted to keep, they've been able to to sign them to these long term deals. Even Zaka last year got a little bit of a, a trial, so to speak, and then got extended as well. So that's another one of your centers that you've locked down. Yeah, which, by the way, interesting to – not that we'll find out publicly, but it, it's interesting to wonder if what happened Saturday with DeBrus being late affects contract negotiations at all or even, you know, where those talks are. We know there's been mutual interest. Both sides have said, you know, they're interested in an extension. So um, just sort of as a side note of that conversation. But, yeah, be – It's because of all those extensions, that whole core that they have locked up, that, which is why, like, I never thought, and I think all of us never thought that there would ever be, like, a true rebuild where they went down towards the bottom of the league. Because when you have Pasenark and Marshan and McAvoy and Lindholm and these goalies, like, you're you're too good to lose that many games. So unless you're going to just start trading guys away, like, that wasn't going to happen what I think is interesting is do they even avoid a bridge year? (laughs) Like, are are they really, you know, are we really going to, like, are we going to be looking at a team that actually is a cup contender? And it's, it's probably too early right now to declare an answer either way. But, you know, we thought if there was going to be any sort of retool, it might be something closer to like 2015 and 2016 where, they missed the playoffs two years in a row, but they still kept a bunch of their core together. Then you got kind of the next wave of Pasenak emerging, McAvoy coming in, and then you're back in the playoffs and you start building up again. Like, I wonder if they even avoided that because, again, they are off to a good start and you're seeing, you know, we wonder, like, where is the where are the next contributors? Where are the next draft picks, prospects coming up? who are going to slide into key spots on the team, not just be fourth liners or 
third pairing guys. And it's like, all right, well, here's Matt Patra, potential top two center. Mason Lori looked really good. You know, needs a little bit of time in Providence, but certainly looks like a top four defenseman on the way, possibly some point this season. So now, like, you are starting to see that. It's going to have to be more beyond that. You know, you're going to need other guys to step up. But that's a pretty damn good start if those two kids are going to be what we think they are um, to help you now build back up with this next group. And I, I guess just to even push that a little further, like if we're talking about it might not even be a bridge year. Like what have you seen from the Bruins so far that would make you think they wouldn't be a cup contender? I, th- well, I mean, as we saw last year with Florida, who I don't think had a Stanley cup final roster, um, I would say they're, they do seem like they're a, a legitimate top six winger away up front, but as we've learned last year, like they had an amazing roster and they got bounced in the first round and a much inferior roster on paper in Florida went four rounds further than the Bruins did. Um, they obviously didn't win the fourth round, but so I would say on paper, Bridget, a top, a, a top six scoring winger, but, and you know, if, if you want to make the case of, of getting a, a, a true top two center, it's like, well, okay, well, they're not out there <laughs> to be traded for. So good luck. Um, so I would say a top six winger. Um, yeah. And, 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 you know what, the other, the other part about it too, is um, obviously the Bruins don't have a ton of draft picks in the next couple of years, but I mean, you just, I mean, you just have a, you have an 18 year old right now uh, playing second line center for you. And, you know, you have Laura in, in the pipeline ready to come up at any moment. And you have Fabian Lysel who you hope can be ready at some point. I mean, if not this year, next year, and it could be an impactful forward. My point is you have young players that are ready to help this team right now in Patra and soon in Laura and in Lysel. Um, in the mean t- to, to give you NHL production while you don't have those draft picks, like, like th- they're helping you bridge those, those years now. Cause like, I mean, you have an 18 year old as your second line center. What else could you ask for in, in like next year's draft? Like, you know what I mean? So, um, they're, they're also helping that seem less painful as well. Yeah. You know, you know, I was just thinking of like when we were kind of touching on the schedule, remember last year, I think it was like late November or maybe like early December. They had a stretch where like, I think they were playing Tampa, Florida, Carolina, and then like a West coast trip with, or like a Western trip with Colorado, Vegas, it was like all these top teams in like a two week span. And like, I remember we had that circled forever and we're like, they're off to this great start. They had like that home, home unbeaten streak. And it was like, let's see how they do, you know, where, how they're looking after that. And obviously last year they came out of that looking pretty good. Um, but I was trying to figure out like, do they have a stretch like that this year? And it's, you know, Bridget touched on like the end of this month, you go Detroit, Florida, and that then that goes into start of November, Toronto, Detroit, Dallas, New uh, Islanders. Like that's a pretty good stretch. Um, there's a couple others. Like then later in November, they have Tampa, Florida, Detroit, Rangers. But they don't really have like that like one super tough stretch. But I guess like to answer Bridget's question, like that's the only thing that would that I feel like I could need to see. Like, I just want to see them go through a tougher stretch of the schedule against some of the best teams and, you know, go five and one, four and two over a tough six game stretch before, before I can say like, okay, I really think they're one of the best teams in, in the league. Um, because like right now I look at them and I'm like, all right, I think they're one of the top eight teams probably, you know, say, top four in the East. Maybe there's four in the West up there. Like I'm, I'm pretty comfortable doing that, but can I confidently say right now, like they're one of the three or four best. I just think I like, I need to see more because again, f- four of their five games so far have been against teams that I don't expect to be in the playoffs. So. Yeah, there's <laughs> definitely, um, sorry, Bridget. There, there, there's definitely, um, I want to see them match, try to match keyword try to match uh, Colorado's speed up front, Dallas's speed up front. Like, I want to see if the Bruins can 
if the Bruins forward group can match, or I guess the five man unit in general, if they can match uh, the top speed of, of the top teams. I will say November is going to be a tough month, right? October so far, not the hardest schedule, but when you look at November, much harder. Um, and a lot of these games that you're playing against tough opponents are on the road. Their, their first test will be Toronto, which will be at home. But then you see Dallas, which a lot of people picked Dallas to be a Stanley Cup finalist. Um, some people picked Dallas to be their Stanley Cup champion this year. They have to play Dallas on the road early in November. I think someone and, on this podcast may have may have picked Dallas. Yes, yes, they, it wasn't me, as you can tell. Um, and then you know they're also playing on the road at Florida at Tampa Bay, at the Rangers, so um, and at Detroit, if you consider Detroit to be a team that that might actually give them a good challenge, they play them twice this month, so uh, this upcoming month in November. So um, that, that t- to me, November is maybe the true test that we haven't seen yet. Um, October brought a lot of teams that aren't going to be in the playoffs. November is going to bring you some conference rivals. You're going to play um, – you're also going to play the Canadians twice in November. So um, definitely a different feel to it. Hopefully uh, it brings the best out of them, but we haven't seen them play against those kind of teams yet. Wait, so they are actually allowed to play other teams from the Eastern Conference? They, Believe they, it or not. Yes, they still do that? They do that. They are going to play against the Canadians, Scott. You, you want to go to Montreal? Yeah. No, uh, no, because I, I think my trip's going to be down to New York Thanksgiving weekend. Boo! We like yeah. Canada better. There's a there's B, B, U, there's a Bruins Rangers then B U Cornell doubleheader at Madison Square Garden. So I'm, wow. I'm all about that. I heard there's a uh, a big Scott McLaughlin uh, float with a Bruins jersey at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade this year, <laughs> which would be pretty cool to watch. So hopefully people can see that on TV. We'll have to tweet that out. It's just a, it's a giant popcorn float. Yeah, exactly. It's just it it is just a giant popcorn float. But then they're like, wait a minute, is there a guy up there? And it's not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's probably maybe where we uh, wrap it up tonight. Any any final discussion points for you guys? Forward didn't no, play. No, I think I'm good. Okay, I was just gonna say forward didn't play the Sunday yeah. game, um, and. Yeah, I don't know if that was just to try to get looks, different looks. I'm, I'm not sure. No, so Forbert's day to day with a lower body injury doesn't sound like anything serious, but um, I guess that that does lead me to one. Well, I would say what was one negative and then had a positive moment, but I thought Ian Mitchell played both games because Kevin Shattenkirk sat Saturday's game. And I thought Ian Mitchell had a tough weekend for the most part. Um, Saturday, he had one shift where he iced it four times in one shift. That's just rough. Sunday, he had two penalties. Um, but then he ends up involved in the transition that leads up to, uh, Potter's first goal. So, you know, and made a nice play in that buildup. So redeem himself a little bit, which is good to see. Still not sure that I'm. I would really be rushing to play him a ton of games going forward, but at least he did finish the weekend on a on a more positive note than where he was. Not right. not to gloss over not not to gloss over that if Forbert does actually have an injury like a day to day with a lower body injury, like you said, does that mean we see a call up on defense? At some point, uh, when the Bruins make it back home, because they're about to end the road trip, is he is if Forbert is going to be out for a little bit of time? Do we see a transaction with Providence for the Bruins on D? That's just something to keep an eye on, I guess. Half past Lori. I mean, <laughs> left, left, left uh, replacement, left shot replacement. I mean, Forbert's uh, because of the role he plays. I mean, just eating shots. It's it happens to him two, three times a year where he has like a you know three weeks off with an injury or five three to five weeks off so um there will be opportunity and if it's not now i'm sure it'll come later so um but yeah so uh bridget and scott uh, if you have nothing else we're good okay thank you all for listening obviously the bruins play the blackhawks on tuesday night and we will talk to you very soon
Hey guys, thanks for watching the Skate Podcast. If you want to see more of our videos, visit our playlist. Not in front of a screen? You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to follow us on social media. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment.